Where we left off last time was examining the um, automobile database that we came up with and we implemented part of it and I think for what we're talking about the part that we implemented is is good enough all right we're implementing a uh, database to track the maintenance performed on automobiles um, the issue is that um, and again this is this is based on a real problem that I encountered in in a previous job the issue is that um, in an auto rental company, especially given the fact that cars move around a lot in an auto rental company, it might be in one branch one day, another branch the next day, it's easy to lose track of what's been maintained and what's been done on the car and you run the risk of, you know, having a car go two years without an oil change or, you know, something horrible like that. So um, what we did is, again, we didn't use a relational database, but we created an application that um, recorded the uh, uh, different maintenances that we wanted to track, recorded the frequency we wanted to track them with, and then we recorded when a, a, a maintenance item was done on each automobile. And then would periodically, I think on a monthly basis, uh, give a report to the managers of the office saying which of their cars needed maintenance done over the next period of time. All right. This is sort of what we came up with, this ERD. All right. We have the automobile table, all right, which is related to a model table, and the model is related to a make table. One thing that we talked about is that we do not have the need to store the make ID in the automobile because that's what's known as a derivable relationship. In other words, um, if we know that an automobile is a focus, we know that focuses are Fords. So we don't need to store associated that the automobile is a Ford. We can derive that by going through the model that it is. And it's important that you don't implement these, uh, uh, um, I don't want to say optional relationships, um, derivable relationships. Because if you do, that's a form of redundancy. In other words, you might say, well, what harm would it be to put the make ID in the automobile? Well, the harm would be that you could inadvertently say the car is a Focus, but the manufacturer of it is Toyota and have a, a contradiction. All right. So that's one thing we had. The other thing we had was the history of the maintenance that was performed on the car, um, which points to the car that was, it was performed on and the specific procedure that was performed. Okay, so those are the tables that we had. All right, where we left off in our cliffhanger on Thursday was what these foreign keys, or how these foreign keys should be set up. All right, with regards to cascading delete and updates. Um, first of all, right off the bat, as far as cascading updates go, these are all using auto-generated keys. So updating is a moot point. We're never going to change any of these keys. All right? We're never going to change any of the auto number keys. Uh, they're assigned by the database. They're guaranteed to be unique. Again, for the most part, uh, with auto number keys, that cascade update really, <laughs> I just flicked the rubber band. I don't know. I should keep my hands uh, quiet here. Um, the, the cascading update really uh, isn't relevant because with auto number keys you don't change the values of them. Um, however, cascading delete does become an issue. In part that issue relates to whether you have strong or weak entities. Now I wish I could give you guidelines and say when this is a situation you cascade delete. When this is a situation, you don't cascade delete. However, it's not that simple. Um, I can give you some maybe rough guidelines. I can make some observations and, and we can talk about it. But really, there's no way out of having judgment and applying judgment to the problem and looking at it and deciding and talking with people in the organization and determining uh, what that is, uh, wh how it should be set up. Now one thing I will mention is sort of the whole business of the identifying relationship or non-identifying relationship also becomes a moot point 
when you use auto number keys, right? Because with an identifying relationship, uh, the one table has, as part of its primary key, the primary key of another table. So with auto number keys, you don't get that. So we're going to focus instead on weak and strong relationships. Does anyone care to define what a weak and a strong relation, or um, I'm saying weak or strong relationship, I guess weak or strong entity and weak and strong relationship is. I guess you look at it from the perspective of a relationship. Let's look at some of the, let's look at, well, let's talk about it first, then we'll look at some of those. What's an example? What makes something a weak relationship or a strong, weak entity or a strong entity? Strong, it stands alone. Itself. Yeah. Strong, it stands alone. It has an existence that doesn't require um, the other entity. And the example that I gave last time is between student and faculty advisor. Now, there's a relationship between student and faculty advisor, but both of those are strong entities, such as if the faculty person goes away, that doesn't mean that the students go away. All right. In those cases where you have a relationship between two strong entities like that, typically you are not going to cascade delete. All right. You are not going to cascade delete for the obvious reason that if your advisor retires, you don't have to drop out of school. All right. And if you delete a person from the faculty table, you shouldn't delete the students that are related to it. Because the students have an existence of their own. Um, to be sure, they have a relationship with a faculty member, but that relationship doesn't, isn't what gives that student its existence. That student has its existence on its own. It's starting to sound like a philosophy class, but I think you get the idea. All right. Now, an example of a weak entity in a relationship, a good example would be what we have right here between automobile and maintenance history. All right. In this table, we have all the automobiles. In this table, we have the maintenance history that uh, is going to be performed. All right. Now, if you think about it, if you no longer have the car, you probably don't care whether an oil change was performed on it or not. All right, it's gone. All right, not much you can do. All right, this record only makes sense when it's associated with this car. This needs a car. I can't have an oil change that wasn't performed with a car. All right, I mean that that kind of doesn't make sense even to word it that way. All right. So the rows in this table really depend on the rows in that table. If there's no automobile, then the maintenance history for that automobile doesn't really make any sense. Doesn't, it's not really important, not really relevant. Therefore, I would say that in this case, a history is a weak entity. All right. Now, I think we can observe that most of the time with strong entities, you probably don't want to cascade deletes. The opposite of cascading deletes is restricting deletes. All right? Not cascade is pretty much the same as restrict. Uh, restrict being the terminology I've heard used in other databases. There actually is a third option that some databases allow, and that is to null out the foreign key. In other words, um, if you deleted a faculty advisor, it would blank out the, foreign, uh, the, the faculty advisor for all the students that that person advised. All right? But access doesn't have that option. With access, either you prevent it from happening or you delete, you cascade delete. <clears throat> With strong entities, you're not going to cascade delete. With a weak entity involved, you may or may not you have to apply some judgment. All right, this is where the judgment comes in. Um, for example, in this case, I guess part of it is whether you consider between model and automobile as being a strong or a weak entity. All right. 
But you could say that, gee, if there's no such model, should I get rid of all the cars for that model, if there's a non-existent model? And I would argue no. A car is something that's pretty important. You don't want to lose information about it in your database. So therefore, if there happened to be a model, that model name that was incorrectly entered, all right, and a car somehow got associated with that, you know, let's say maybe someone entered in focus spelled wrong in the model table, all right. So there were cars that were listed as Ford Focuses, and then there were cars that were listed under the um, spelling error for focus. I wouldn't want to be able to go in and delete the, the, the bogus uh, model and take out cars that were associated with it. All right. So if a car was associated with a model that wasn't really valid, I wouldn't want to delete that model. I would want to be told, hey, look, I can't delete that model because this exists. All right. There's a car that exists for that. All right. So let's look at this for a second. We have one, two, three, four relationships. Let's take two minutes and you know, write down on a little sheet of paper or whatever in your notes. I'm going to write the, the relationships here. Let's think if we would want to cascade or restrict these deletes. So these are the four relationships that we have in our database right now. Take a second, think through them. Let me try to figure out a way so you can see that better. Didn't really help, huh? Ah. Here's the culprit, I think. There we go. All right, let's take a minute and think this. If I was a better singer, I would sing the little Jeopardy theme for the people that are watching this in the online class, but we'll skip that. All right, let's go through these one at a time. Um, before we do that, let's explore an, and I, I should have talked about this before, but oh well, better late than never. Let's talk about an, an aspect of cascading deletes that you may not have thought before. The word cascading, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's just going to go from one table to a second table. It could cascade from a second table through a third table. So, for instance, I wouldn't suggest we do this, so this isn't the right answer, but if every one of our relationships was a cascade delete, all right, if we deleted a, a make, that would delete all the models associated with that make, that would delete all the cars associated with that model, and it would delete all the history associated with those cars. 
So we can potentially cascade delete from table to table to table. All right? So it isn't just delete from here and delete from the other table. It actually cascades to multiple tables. Now, here's the interesting thing, or uh, 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 another interesting thing, is this activity is either going to succeed or it's going to fail completely. All right? In other words, let's say I had a cascade delete between make and model. So if I deleted a make, it would delete all the models that were associated with that make. If I had a restrict delete for that, if I, try, if I deleted a make, it tried to delete a model, and that model had automobiles, it would prohibit deletion. All right? So that's an important thing to know. It's not like going to do some of the stuff. It's not going to delete like some of the stuff and leave some of the stuff. It's either going to delete everything or it's going to leave everything. It's not going to like half delete stuff. All right. Um, I'll, I'll show some examples with this. After we decided, um, after we decide on how we want to set these cascade deletes, we'll play around with it a little bit and we'll see exactly how how this uh, how this will go. Anyhow, back to our set of relationships. Between model and make, would that be cascade or restrict? Okay, we have a vote for restrict. Do we have dissenting votes? All right, let's go on to the next one, between automobile and model. Keep in mind how this works. Again, we're talking about, when we talk about cascading delete, we're talking about if you delete the parent, does it delete the child or children? So if I delete the make, will it delete the model? If I delete the model, will it delete the automobile? Little arrow here indicates this one points to that, so that's the child, that's the parent. Model, would you make that cascade or restrict? I kind of gave my answer already here, all right, unless I'm trying to trick you, which I'm not. I would make that restrict. Automobiles are important enough that I don't want to lose data about them if I simply have something bogusly coded. And I'll show you exactly what I mean with that. Between automobile and maintenance history, Restrict or cascade? I think you can cascade that one, right? If you don't have that car, who cares when the oil change was done on it? All right. Last, if I delete a procedure from my list of maintenance procedures that I want to track, do I delete the history for it? Or do I, do I cascade it or do I restrict? Yeah. Okay. That one, I feel, can kind of go either way. It depends on the actual... Yeah. How long do you want to keep information whether that car is gone? Or right. Yeah. The money you put out for the procedure. Yeah. That's true. You could even make an argument for the, the cascade delete of the automobile to say, hey, no, if it has maintenance history, let's keep it out there. Let's run maybe periodically a purge routine that will take all the cars that we've sold and take them out and extract that. So yeah, this can actually get very, very involved. The statement was made that with procedure, between procedure and, and maintenance, that maybe you want to keep the maintenance just to know what your maintenance costs were for a period of time, even if you've gotten rid of the car. So that's valid. All right, that's a valid point. Um, for the sake of argument and just for the sake of balance, we'll make this one a cascade. Really, the purpose of this database that we defined, and this is one thing that you'd have to go back to when you're making your judgment call, the purpose of this was to notify people when certain maintenance were done. All right? So in a way, this database sort of had a limited scope. So as far as your point, that's an excellent point. In a larger scale database where maybe there were financial information that you were holding and all that, you might want to keep these maintenance, this maintenance data around even after you got rid of the car or whatever. But in this case, given that the purpose of this database was really to inform 
uh, the managers, uh, office managers, when certain maintenance is done, when the car's gone, it's no longer relevant All right, for this. So we'll say those are cascade. Now, one thing I would say is we might be able to cascade this deletion as long as we restrict this one. All right. Why do I say that? Well, if there's a case of a model, and, uh, a make and model, that we don't have any cars for, sure, if you delete the make, get rid of the model. All right. If it was entered incorrectly, or if it's some obscure make a car that we don't have in our rental fleet, and we want to just get rid of that manufacturer, uh, sure, take out all the models. All right. So that's what I'm going to implement. I'm going to implement this with the cascading deletes, and then we'll play around with it, and we'll see the impact of it. So let me go in, and between make and model, I am going to cascade delete. Between model and automobile, I'm not going to cascade delete, which again, the opposite of that is to restrict deletion. Between automobile and history, I'm going to cascade. Whoops. And between procedures and history, I'm going to cascade. Now, one thing to remember, and, and it's real often the way that, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, very often on the midterm or, or on the final, people get the idea of cascading deletions, but they get it backwards. All right. For example, the cascading deletes only work when you delete the parent, does it delete the children. So, if I delete a model, let's forget the rest of these relationships. If I delete a model, it won't go and try to delete the make. Because in this relationship, the model is the child and the make is the parent. The make is, a, is the entity on the one side of the relationship. The model is the entity on the many side. So you can call that the child and the make the parent. So it doesn't work going the other direction. Um, it works only from if you delete the parent, does it try to delete the children. And the reason for that is remember the whole purpose of this. The whole purpose of this is to enforce referential integrity. If we delete a parent row in this table, we, and there are models associated with that make, that can't stay like that. We can't get rid of the make and leave the models out there. So we have two choices. We don't allow the deletion of the make, or we delete all the models associated with it. That's our two choices and two choices only. All right, so let's go in and let's put a make, we'll put as number one an Edsel and number two a Ford for model, I don't know what a model of Edsel was, we'll just say Edsel, focus um, is associated with Ford. Keep in mind, I'm just sort of putting the data in the back door, all right? Uh, we would not give the users this kind of form. Um, we're just entering some test data here with some very, you know, just a couple of makes and a couple of models, so I can remember those codes, all right? What's another model of Ford? Fusion. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to enter a couple automobiles. Pardon me? Oh, sorry. All I did is I went in and ordered, entered Edsel and Ford, Edsel, Focus, and Fusion. Let's go in and enter some cars in. ABC123, Ohio. Model ID, we'll make this a Focus and we'll make it a 2011, and we'll make it blue. Let's enter in uh, a yellow 
fusion. First thing I want you to notice, the changes that you requested to the table were not successful because they would create duplicate values in the index, primary key, or relationship. Change the data in the field or fields that contain duplicate data, remove the index, or redefine the index to permit duplicate entries and try again. Well, that's a very descriptive error message. What does that really mean? What did I do wrong in entering this data in? Yeah, exactly. If you remember, VIN number and state and plate were candidate keys, right? You can identify a car based on its VIN number. That's unique, all right? Likewise, the license plate number along with the state is a combination that's unique. So I made two unique indexes in this table. So I can't go in, so I'll go in and I'll change the VIN. And I will change the plate. So now I'm in business. All right, and I can enter those. So here's what we have. Let's take a look. I have a focus and a fusion. In fact, let me write this on a sheet of paper that we can bounce back and forth between. Under make, I have an Edsel and a Ford. Under model, I have a focus and a fusion which are both Fords and under auto I have a blue focus and a yellow fusion. All right. Other piece of information. I cascaded this delete, I restricted this re delete, all right. Okay, so what's going to happen, here we can put this side by side. I hope, hope you can follow what I'm trying to do with this. There we go. What's going to happen with this? Whoops. I also have an Edsel model. That's an Edsel. What's going to happen if I delete Edsel from the make table? What will that do? What will the impact be? Will it succeed or fail? Okay. Why will it succeed? Okay. In other words, and will what else will it delete from the tables? What's the other thing it will delete from the tables? It'll delete this model that is an Edsel as well. So let's look, let's look at our tables real quick. We have our make table where 1 and 2 are Edsel and Ford. We have our model table where model ID of 1 is Edsel, which is associated with Edsel. Model ID 2 is a focus, which is associated with Ford. 
Model ID3 is a Fusion which is associated with Ford. And there are no cars that are of Model 1, which is Edsel. So, if I go in and delete Edsel, what's going to happen? What's it going to take out? It's going to succeed. It's going to delete Edsel from the make table. And it will also delete Edsel from the model table. All right? It's more or less warning you that. It's not telling you exactly what it's going to delete, but it's telling you, hey, you're taking out more than just that make. All right? You're taking out one other record other than the make. And if that's okay, it'll go and delete it. So now if we look in the model table, model ID of one, which was an Edsel, is gone. And only the two Ford models remain. So this guy's gone, and this guy's gone. All right. What happens if I try to delete Ford? Won't delete. Why not? Well, right. What it will do is it will say, okay, let me go and delete Ford. If I delete Ford, I'm going to cascade and I'm going to delete all the models associated with Ford. So I'm going to also delete this and this. However, since there's a restrict constraint for deletion between model and auto, it won't let me delete focus if there's a car on the table that is a focus. So the deletion of focus will fail. And remember, this is going to either completely succeed or completely fail. All right? And therefore, um, the deletion will fail. All right? So let's go and see that in action. If I go in this make table and try to delete it, it tells me I can't do it. Can't perform cascading operations since related records exist in table. Referential, referential integrity rules would be violated. So the fact that there's a restrict relation from the, um, from the automobile will keep that from being deleted. Now, let's say we found that, that what we thought was a fusion was actually another focus. So we don't have a fusion and a focus. We have two focuses, two foci, or whatever, whatever you'd say. All right. So we have two focuses in this table. Now, if I go and try to delete Ford, what's going to happen? Same thing. Will it delete? Will it be able to delete focus from the model table? No, because remember. This is one transaction. Either everything succeeds or nothing succeeds. So if there's one thing that's blocked through these cascading deletes, then the cascading delete fails. All right? So if I went in here and said delete Ford, again, we get the same restriction. All right? And if we go and look, in the model table, both those models remain, even though Fusion has no cars associated with it. Whoops. I must have forgot to change that. Okay. Even when I do change it, it doesn't cascade the deletes. Now, what if I try to delete Fusion? Will I be able to delete Fusion as a make in the table based on how the foreign keys are set up now? Right. The answer is yes, because there's no automobiles associated with that. All right? So, 
If I go into the model table and I try to delete fusion, it's able to do that. All right. Now, if we were to get rid of the automobiles, we could then delete Ford and it would get rid of everything, models, or get rid of any models that were associated with that. All right, it's important to understand this and it's important to know that we can give you some general guidelines, but you're always going to need to apply some judgment in determining um, whether you want to keep it or not. Um, student raised a good point about wanting to keep historical data. So even though the maintenance record may not really be relevant, if we were keeping maintenance information for other reasons, like to, to analyze the maintenance cost or whatever, then we might not even want to have a deletion of the history uh, of the repairs if you delete the automobile. But again, the way we define this one of just saying, well, this is just to keep track of what was done on what car, we could say, hey, if you delete the car, uh, you can delete the history. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean you can never delete certain data? No, it means that there will be applications written and procedures written to sort of purge the database from um, stuff uh, that, uh, that you want to get rid of. Let's take, for example, the hypothetical situation of a faculty member, you know, retiring, being deleted from the faculty table, if they have several students that they advise. All right, we know that you can't cascade the delete, right? You can't delete all the students just because you delete the faculty member. What could you do? Well, within your application, you could do something like this. So we have our faculty table having a relationship with the student table. We could do something like this. In our application that deleted faculty, we could have a screen, and this wouldn't necessarily be an access. This would be something that maybe you'd write in Visual Basic or C Sharp or Java or some other language. We might have the faculty information on the top of the screen. You know, first name, last name, etc. A button to delete. When we press the button to delete, if there's students, it might say, hey, here's a list of students that that faculty person advises. And show a list of them. Then you might give them choices. Maybe you let them reassign those students to another advisor. Maybe there's sort of a mass reassign that, you know, well, you know let's say if I were to win the lottery, and, and quit, and they deleted me, maybe all the students I advise would go be advised by Professor Norod. So there might be a drop down to say reassign to, and you could pick that person, and then it would change all these. After it changed them, then there would be no records related to me, and you could delete me. There's a lot of things that you could do on the application level. All right. And those of you that maybe have studied in some other software development courses might think, well, gee, I could do this or I could do that. You're absolutely right, you could. The focus in this class, though, is understanding and defining how things are going to be on the database level. All right? In other words, it's our job on the database level to make sure that we enforce referential integrity and that we don't allow bogus data to be created and we don't allow, um, how can I put this, important data to be deleted. We don't want to delete student rows in our student table. We don't want to delete automobiles. So we're going to put, we're not going to have cascading delete for those fields. Now, 
if there's something that you can do, you know, let's say, for example, that, you know, a certain model was, you know, we decided not to carry a certain model in our car rental company again. We could have a user interface that sort of retire the fleet and maybe it would go and purge or copy to another table or whatever all the cars that we were getting rid of and then it could delete the model in the make if we decided that we were no longer interested in carrying that. Any questions about any of this? What I'd like to do now is do a little bit with the um, creation of forms and reports for this database. I'll go back in and enter a couple of couple of models. Oops. All right. Let's go in and create a form. The make and model I went in and just created that way because these are small tables, not terribly interesting. <laughs> let's go in and let's create a good form for the automobile now. All right. So, if I want to go in and create a form for the automobile, I can go in and say create, or let's go and put some procedures in here. Oil change three. Um, tire rotation. Okay, so we have two procedures in here. All right, let's go and let's make a form for the automobile. I'm going to go in under create and say create form. And it actually does a lot of work for me, all right? That's not always a good thing, all right? Sometimes you think if something does the work for you, that's great. Yeah, it means that I don't have to do it. Well, not always, right? Because if it doesn't do it the right way, um, you know, you may have to rework it. So we're going to take and we're going to redo part of this form. You know it came up with a form for us. We're going to go in and we're going to create our own subform and we're going to create a drop down for the model ID. Because as we said before, you shouldn't have to memorize the model IDs that, you know, focus was four now and fusion was five. I don't remember. You shouldn't have to remember. All right. You should just be able to pick from a list. In addition, same thing here. I'm going to create my own subform so I can control how that form acts. The one thing with any software, uh, tool, any development tool that you use. It's great when it does stuff for you, but when it does stuff for you, it does it the way it wants to do it. And sometimes it's better to take control and create it the way you want to create it. So let's go in to design view. I'm going to delete out the history table and I'm going to create my own subform there. And I'll do that in a minute. First thing though I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to delete the model ID. And I'm going to go and drag on here a combo box. I had a student in the morning class, uh, my morning class, uh, in the middle of class, their laptop blurted out that they just won a $100 gift card from Walmart or something like that, which they probably didn't actually win. Uh, I hope they weren't too disappointed. All right, remember when we, when we create a drop down, what we're doing is we don't want to have to remember the code. So we want to be able to pick something that's descriptive from a list and have the code sort of stored behind the scenes. So in other words, I want the combo box in this case to look up the tables in a, in a table or query. 
I want it to look up the values for the model ID. So what table do I want to look it up from? The model table. Which fields contain the values that you want to include in your combo box? Well, I want to include the model name. Sorted alphabetical order probably is a good idea. That's what it's going to look like. That looks reasonably good. Here's the key question, the thing that most people, if they're going to mess up on this, mess up on. Either they mess up on the first screen or the last screen. You don't want to remember the value for later use. I'm not even really sure what that means. <laughs> All right. You want to store that value in a field. And the field that you want to store it is you want to store the model ID that you pick from the list in the model ID of the automobile table. And then I can create a name for it and I should be ready to roll. So now let's go into, and I can make it a little bigger if I want. Now let's go into form view and we can enter some cars in. VIN number, you know, state, Ohio, plate number, the auto year 2011, color blue, and we can pick from here if it's a focus or a fusion. You can go on to the next car and enter a different VIN number, different state, different plate, also 2011, color yellow, and we can pick a fusion. Now if we go out of this and look, we can look at the automobile table, whoops, we can look at the automobile table and see that it got the right model ID. All right, Because we set up the combo box correctly to, to pull the model ID from the model table and stuff it in the model ID of the automobile table. The last thing I want to do is I want to go back and I want to create the subform for the history for this. All right. So, go back into design view. And under design, one of these options is a sub report or a sub form. I click on it, click it here, and I get another wizard. All right. Do I want to use existing tables or queries or use an existing form? I don't, this is the only form I have, so I, that option is grayed out. What do I want to show on the sub report? Now, here's where it gets confusing sometimes, but it's pretty straightforward if you stop and think about it. We have this relationship. We have automobiles which have a relationship to the history table which have a relationship to the procedure table. Now, a lot of students think in the subform, gee, I want to see the oil changes and the uh, tire rotations and all that. So therefore, I need this table. No, you need this table. You want to see for this car the history that was performed. You don't want to see simply a list of all the possible procedures. You want to see the procedures that were performed on this car. Now one of the attributes in this table is going to be the procedure that was performed. So we can create a drop down for that. All right. Let's go and create the form and then next time we'll create the drop down on this because I notice that we're out of time here. So let me go in and I'm going to say I want the data to come from the history table. I want to see the procedure ID and the date performed. Yeah. I'm really not hitting that today. All right. Now, after I pick that, if I've defined my foreign keys correctly, it should know how to link the main form to the subform. 
In other words, how do I link the automobile with the repair history table? Through the automobile ID. And it might be a little hard for you to see, but that's essentially what this says. Show each history for each record in automobile using the automobile ID to link the two, which is exactly what we want. So we click finish, and we can play around a little bit with the size if we want. And now we can go into form view, and we can actually put in that this car had um, a tire rotation on 9 2011 that this car had a oil change on 9 2011 and so on. Now, again, we only have two procedures, so I remembered one was oil change, two was tire rotation. We're going to want to do the same thing for procedure ID like I did for model ID. I'm going to want to make a drop down for that. Uh, and we'll do that next time. All right, this is where we'll pick up next time. But what we'll see is, is we're sort of moving from just the very basic, let's just put some data in by going into the table and entering the data that way. That's not a tool that you want to give to your users. You'd want your users to use nice little forms where things are clearly identified and they can look at it and they can understand. They could pull up a car and see Okay, here's all the repairs that were done for it. So nice use of the form and subform. That will be our starting point uh, on class on Thursday. All right, we'll see you over in lab.